So we're going to move straight into the first of three discussions over the next three days. So we'll move straight into the first of three discussions over the next uh, three days. And Nati and I have the easy topic of what is quantum field theory. So <laughs> the way it'll work is Nati uh, from Princeton will give about a 15 minute presentation. I'll follow with a 15 minute presentation. Um, and so please save your questions uh, for after that. We'll have a half hour discussion and we encourage everybody to chime in with their own comments about what is QFT. So Nati, go ahead. Uh, first of all, can you see the slide? Yes. yes. And can you hear me? Yes. Both. Well, if you answer the first question, I guess the answer to the second one is redundant. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm not a member of the collaboration. I wish I was a member of the collaboration. It's a great honor to be the first speaker. I think I'm the oldest. I'm not 100% sure about that. I'd like to congratulate you for the collaboration and congratulate the Simons Foundation for putting together such a fantastic group of people working on a timely topic. And I wish everybody success. So I have two contradicting uh, requirements in this talk. First, the topic, uh, the question is easy, as Dan said, what is quantum field theory? And I'll say right away, I do not know the answer to that, but I'd like to shed some light on it. But on the other hand, I heard the introductory comments before, and I didn't find them introductory to my talk, because the talk I prepared is much more an introductory and much more uh, elementary than what we have just heard. So how should we think about quantum field theory? One reason this is so challenging and so difficult is that there's no obvious rational point of view to start with. There are many different ways to address the subject, many different ways to try to describe it, but none of them is perfect and none of them covers the whole thing. Inspired by <clears throat> Ken Infiligator, I guess he's a member of the collaboration, we can compare that to the famous story about the blind people with the elephant. Every one of them sees a tiny fraction of the whole beast, but none of them understand the whole thing. So what I will do in the coming slides is, what I'll do in the coming slides is to present some of these different views and the relations between them. I think most of you know almost everything I'm going to say perhaps not in this particular organization, but I thought it would be a nice way to put, to lay it all out so that you can see what we're talking about. Um, it's really important that we don't really know the answer to this question. And the fact that we don't know the answer to this question is the reason we have this panel with a question mark at the end of the title. And I've been arguing for years, <coughs> sorry, that answering this question, namely what is quantum field theory, will lead to deep advances, insights, and even if you are just kind of a pragmatic physicist who would like to get numbers and is not particularly interested in the general abstract picture, I'm quite convinced that understanding the general abstract structure will lead to new advances which will actually lead to numbers that can agree with experiments. So this would be very concrete and therefore very useful even for people who would just like to get numbers and not get the big picture. So let me go through the various views. The first of them is the one that is usually being taught in quantum field theory 101. We start with a free Lagrangian and we perturb around it. We use perturbation theory and then there are more sophisticated perturbation theories like large N, epsilon, epsilon expansion and so forth. Also within this framework, we start with the Lagrangian, we can look for interesting classical configurations and they prove various non-perturbative effects. And for every, I'll have, one slide per view, and on every slide, I'll have the pros and the cons. What's good about this view and what's bad about it? So what's good about this, this has been enormously successful. And when we hear talks in this conference, we might tend to forget how powerful and successful this elementary view is. It has led to 
trillions and trillions of results that agree between theory and experiment in the context of particle physics, the standard model of particle physics, the LHC, and so forth. In the context of the phases of condensed matter physics, classification of phases, phase transitions between them, the bulk of this body of work, which makes quantum field theory so interesting, really comes from this weak coupling view. And this is something that we shouldn't forget. The bad news is that there is no complete non-perturbative control, and there is no understanding of strong coupling. If the theory is very strongly coupled and there are strong non-perturbative effects, we do not know how to compute here. Even worse, some theories cannot be described this way, and I'll say more about that below. So this view, powerful as it is, does not cover all cases, and even cases that it does cover does not lead to powerful enough calculation of skills. There's a subset of it, which is particularly close to my heart, and this is the supersymmetric view. And I emphasize that this is a subset of the previous view. And here we use theories that we use supersymmetry to control some of these theories, and that allows us to compute some observables. So we use supersymmetry to constrain the answer, and the answer is sometimes so constrained that we can write an explicit formula for it. Now, there is an assumption here that the theories make sense. Nobody proved that these theories make sense. So the logic here is that we start with the weak coupling approach, with this Lagrangian approach. We assume that it makes sense, and we take it all the way to strong coupling, and we can constrain the answer. The good news is that it has led to many exact results, new insights. It uncovered a very rich structure, and I'm sure some of that will be discussed here later in, the, in this meeting. And it also had impacts to mathematics, and most of the connection between quantum field theory and mathematics goes through the supersymmetric view. Another aspect of it, which I view as very significant, is that it gives confidence that quantum field theory really makes sense. I think that before the supersymmetric view, it was widely accepted, among, it was widely viewed among mathematicians that this structure is not rigorous, it doesn't really make sense, we don't know what we are talking about. And the fact that it agrees with experiment did not, was not sufficiently convincing. But the fact that it gave new results in mathematics really made a transition in how this subject is viewed. And for me, it gives me more confidence that the structure of quantum field theory, even though we don't know what it is, even though it's not rigorous, does make sense. This is something that we ought to understand. I'd like to emphasize here something that some practitioners in this view, in the supersymmetric view, tend to forget. What, when we compute things using the supersymmetric view, we compute a tiny, tiny fraction of the calculable observables. The bulk of the observables, most of the observables, we have no control over them, we do not know how to calculate them. There's a tiny fraction of them, which is often called the chiral sector, the DPS sector, the topological sector, and so forth, which is calculable. But most of the interest in quantum field theory is not in that. Most of the interest in quantum field theory is to compute all the other objects. Making analogy to mathematics, this captures, roughly speaking, some topological aspects of the space, telling us almost nothing about the metric. And the bulk of interest in quantum field theory is in the metric in all these detailed local structure. Yet there's another view on the subject, which I'll refer to as the lattice view. Here we start from a lattice with local fields at local ed sides, links, edges, uh, faces, etc., and we write some local interactions between them, and then we take the continuum. Limit. This is also extremely powerful. It's very physical. We really know what it is. Uh, we, we have good intuition about what it is. It's rigorous. The lattice theory makes perfect sense. It's a finite dimensional interval if we use a functional interval. The, a point of view, or it's a Hilbert space for a finite number of degrees of freedom. So it really makes sense. It leads to non-perturbative control, and it also opens the way to numerical results. And these numerical results, because this is something we can put in the computer, they agree with experiments. And again, both in high energy physics and in condensed matter physics, most of the numerical work, not all of it, really uses the lattice view. And again, spectacular agreement between theory and experiment. But just as these are the pros, there are also cons. It does not work in many cases, it does not work for theoretical reasons or pragmatic reasons. 
First, in some cases, there's no lattice version of the theory. So we write a continuum theory, and but we don't know how to lattice it. In fact, in some cases, there isn't even a continuum Lagrangian, let alone the lattice version of it. So these are huge challenges. And what they tell us is that, nice as it is, the lattice view does not cover all cases. I should emphasize that some people in, condens in the condensed matter community disregard that, and they think that quantum field theory is only the lattice field. Whatever we don't get from a lattice is not a quantum field theory. And I really strongly disagree with this view. I'm convinced that there are quantum field theories that do not have a lattice version. The other challenge is want to make it more rigorous. Lattice theory exists and it's rigorous, but we need to prove that the continuum limit exists. And the continuum limit is not obvious. And the big challenge in proving, say, that QCD exists, which is one of the important play problems, are, is to prove that the limit really exists and it does not depend on the details of how we take the data. One interesting aspect of this story is that it recently gave us a glimpse of going outside the standard framework of quantum field theory. So I've been talking about the different views of quantum field theory in the various slides here. But the lattice recently, and I'll soon talk more about it, gave us a glimpse that there might be more to quantum field theory than we think. There might be more quantum field theories which go outside the standard framework. The other view, which is kind of distinct from the others, is the stringy view. We take string theory, and we take various limits of string theory and decouple gravity. So if we take the limit of string theory and the limit that we set Newton constant to zero, we have a non-gravitational field, we have a non-gravitational theory, and we can hope that this would be a quantum field theory. The other approach in the string view is that we study string theory in a, in a space which is asymptotically anti the pseudo space, and then we use holography to find a theory without gravity on the boundary. So again, I have the good news and the bad news. The good news is that this has led to new insights. Many non-Lagrangian theories, for example, the 2 zero theory, and that by itself, the two zero theory, for example, gave us a lot of new insight into mathematics, into N equals four super young mills, new N equals two theories, and so forth. It also shows that there is more to quantum field theory than we thought until the mid nineties. There are theories in higher dimensions, there are various non-Lagrangian theories, and not only non-Lagrangian means that we cannot even write the Lagrangian in the continuum, let alone put them on the lattice and use the lattice view. So all this is fantastic, the problem is that there's no intrinsic definition of the theory. Even by physicist standards, we just stumble on examples, we take various limits, and we have no idea with the example that we stumble on what it has to do with the other approaches. Is there a Lagrangian or there isn't a Lagrangian? Sometimes we find it, sometimes we don't. So we don't see how this is connected to the rest. And this is not a constructive description of the theory. We just find examples and we give them names. Another aspect of it is that, again, we see a glimpse of going outside the standard framework. The examples I have in mind are the little string theory and field theory on the non commutative spaces. I'll soon say more about that. So we see here that this stringy view covers a part of the elephant, not all of it. It covers a part that is not covered by the previous views, but it also covered parts that I do not know whether these parts are really part of the same elephant, or maybe this is part of a different elephant. But whatever it is, it's outside what we would think is the standard elephant. Then there is a more abstract view, which usually comes under the name of, uh, is usually being explored by what is called mathematical physicists. And we'll hear more about that in this talk, and we heard a little bit about that in the introduction. Here we have a list of operators or defects that depending on whether they are stretching the time direction or not, and they could be point, lines, etc. And we have a list of correlation functions. So we have no Lagrangian, no lattice, no nothing. What we have is just a long list, typically an infinite list, and some correlation functions. And then we impose consistency conditions that these correlation functions should satisfy. More mathematically, we impose some axioms that need to be satisfied. Naively, this is the most general approach because we don't take any prejudice that there's a Lagrangian or weak coupling and so forth. And it has led to a few concrete advances, especially recently. But I would like to emphasize that the advances here, are the number of them is tiny 
compared with the numerical agreement of the Lagrangian and the lattice views that I presented earlier. It's very long distance between this abstract view and say data at the LHC. So this is the good news. And the bad news is there is really a relation to the other approaches. When we have a, such a consistent theory, we might, we might not know whether there is a Lagrangian for it or not. So we don't know whether it can be lattice or not. And it's, I'm not convinced also that it covers all cases, especially the cases that go outside the standard framework of quantum field theory. Now, there's a subset of this abstract view, which I named the solvable view. Here, we follow that abstract view and we impose the consistency conditions. And sometimes there are some special symmetries. And these special symmetries allow us, the consistency condition allow us to completely nail down the answer and solve the system. In this class, there are various integrable models. The conformal bootstrap, which again, has another Simon's collaboration to explore only that. And in the context of conformal bootstrap, I would also put, put the subject of rational conformal field theory, which led to the discovery of modular tensor categories. And these two results, the modular tensor category and other things, led to the subject of topological quantum field theory. So I would put all these topics together, the integrable models, conformal bootstrap, DQFT, modular tensor categories, and so forth, I'll put all of them in one basket as the solvable view. And the good news, again, is there are many exact results. These systems are exactly solvable. We can compute all or almost all we would like to compute. This is unlike earlier results. It's exact in the sense that there is no approximation. And if we had any doubt that the theory exists, this is a manifestation that this theory exists because here is an example where we satisfy all the axioms and everything is great. Everything is true. We know that the system exists. We are not discussing the empty set, but something that is very concrete. The bad news is that it's not applicable in most cases. The solvable cases are rare and far between. Most cases are not solvable. And it sometimes, there's, even though we know what the solution is, the relation to the other approaches is not clear. We can be presented when exactly solve quantum field theory, but we have no Lagrangian description of it, no lattice description, we don't know what it is. I mentioned earlier various glimpses of going outside the standard framework, or going beyond the standard quantum field theory. And I mentioned them in two of the, the views. The first was in the stringy view, and here, the examples that are close to my heart, are little string theory and field theory in non-commutative space. Little, both of them are non-gravitational. Little string theory does not have local operators. And it also has T-duality, which means that it does not have a standard energy momentum tensor. These two aspects of it makes, make, us, make clear that it's not a standard quantum field theory, yet it exists. If string theory exists, and this thing exists, not rigorous, but it exists. And it has very funny locality properties that we don't understand. And it shows us that there is something very deep, which is still missing in our understanding. The second is the case of field theory non-commutative space. Here we can start with the same field theory, say five-fourth field theory, on a commutative space. And it has certain UV divergences. But once we put it on a non-commutative space, some of the UV divergences turn into infrared divergences. This is very strange because in standard field theory, the UV and the I are separate. That comes under the name of separation of scales. This is at the heart of the renormalization group. And more philosophically, it's related to reductionism in science, where we formulate the theory at short distances in the UV, and we read off the answer at long distances in the IR. But in these cases, the UV and the IR are all mixed together. The second, the second place where we get a glimpse into going beyond standard quantum field theory is certain lattice models. I like to call them exotic lattice models, and I've been working with fantastic collaborators over the last, over the pandemic and a little earlier, studying them and trying to fit them into standard quantum field theory. I think some of these collaborators are in the audience. And they are characterized by subsystem symmetry, which is a very peculiar symmetry, which does not fit the description of symmetry presented in the introductory comments earlier in this talk. 
The symmetry operator here is to some extent topological, but not completely topological. It's invariant under some changes, but not others. So that is interesting in its own right. But what I find most interesting here is again, the mixture of UV and IR. So the common thing of all these things that go outside standard quantum field theory is the UVIR mixing. Long distance physics is sensitive to short distance physics. There is no clear separation of scales. It's not clear how to think about it in the standard renormalization group point of view. And I think what the main lesson of that is that successful as it is quantum field theory, we don't understand it. There might be more beyond quantum field theory that we ought to understand. As my time is up, I should finish. And every talk ends with a conclusion. But I think that here, it's better to end with no conclusions. So I think I'll stop here and let Dan take over. Thank you. Can I, can I close this one or? Uh, yeah, it's okay to close. Uh, you need to share your screen. Yeah, I shared my screen already. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, let me start with um, with saying what quantum field theory is by addressing the meta question of how do we say what anything is, but anything in mathematics. So if the thing X is unique, then we characterize it by universal property. So that happens all over algebra, but the first example we teach our undergraduates is the real numbers, which is characterized as being the unique complete ordered field. If it's a class of objects, then we try to axiomatize some of its key features. So a group, a homology theory, manifold, and so on. Whoops. So I emphasize that these definitions are neither a construction nor a classification. So that characterization of the real numbers doesn't talk about infinite decimals, doesn't talk about convergence, Cauchy sequences, Dedekind cuts, and all that. But it's characterizing something very essential about the real numbers. And one thing about extracting this kind of structure, this definition or axiom system, is that we can recognize that structure in new situations. So one way is through what I might call marriages and mutations. So if we just take the concept of a group and we marry it with the concept of a smooth manifold, we get a Lie group with a topological space, topological group, and so on. And you see all the different uh, ways it can morph. And in fact, many of these structures are very uh, appropriate, very much in this collaboration. And we could have started with algebra and done a similar list, and those two are in this collaboration. But I want to emphasize that this kind of axiom system arises from examples. It doesn't just come out of the thin air. And the point is it gives rise to further examples. It applies to further examples. So that's the way I want to approach the question that we can't really answer. What is a quantum field theory? And I'm going to tell you three different pairs of axiom systems that have been used over the years to try to address it. So the first pair is about quantum systems in general, about quantum mechanics. The first one, sometimes called Dirac von Neumann axioms, um, are very familiar. A Hilbert space gives rise to states and observables. And there you see um, the books by Dirac and von Neumann, I think. And uh, actually, Mackey's book has a very nice description of that. And there's also an algebraic version that emphasizes the observables. And that's due, again, to von Neumann, Irving Siegel, and many others. And it's focused on the C star algebra, say, of observables. So I like to think of this as the Schrodinger-Heisenberg. It's a little bit ahistorical, maybe, the way that they're used. But the Schrodinger that emphasizes states, the Heisenberg that emphasizes observables. Well, when we come to Minkowski space-time, 
in quantum field theory in Minkowski space-time, again, there are two axiom systems. The uh, Schrodinger view is the Whiteman axioms, and the Heisenberg view, this Hogg-Kostler axiom system. So again, the Whiteman axioms start with a Hilbert space of states, or its projective space, or the pure states in the system, and um, emphasizes the correlation functions. The Hogg-Kostler emphasizes the algebras of observables now depending on a region in space-time. So there are two uh, modern versions of these, in a way, which take place in wick-rotated curved uh, manifolds. So you should think Riemannian signature. And I've put here the Heisenberg first. On the other slides, the Schrodinger type was first. And that's due to Costello and Gwilliam, and it's in two books that are recently out. It has the overwhelming advantage that that third book gives foundations for constructing, in a mathematical framework, examples using perturbation theory. So these are examples that exist over formal power series. They're examples in perturbation theory. And that's been very, very powerful. I'm not going to talk very much about that one. It's newer. I'm not um, as much versed in that, but uh, I don't mean to give it in any sense short shrift. It should be viewed equally, as I say, in this Schrodinger-Heisenberg kind of dichotomy. So the other ones uh, was due originally to Graham Siegel for two-dimensional conformal field theory, and then Michael Atia shortly afterwards for topological field theory. And um, so they're sometimes called the Atia-Siegel kind of axiom system. So let me say uh, briefly what it is. It was really, I think, did accomplish some of the things on the first slide. It really did open a new pathway into quantum field theory for many, many of us, a more geometric, topological, algebraic kind of pathway into quantum field theory. So one analogy you could keep in mind is to think about having a group of some sort and having a linear action of that group, or we could have an algebra and a linear action of the algebra module over the algebra. So the domain of a field theory, instead of a group, is a bordism category. So these were originally introduced, by the way, by Jack Milner in his uh, book about H, uh, the H-cobordism theorem. He talked about a category of bordisms. And so the objects are closed n minus one manifolds, but you should think of them as living in a cloud, a little germ embedded in an n manifold. And the morphisms between two such uh, manifolds are the bordisms, like this. So the red arrows indicate which are the incoming boundary components, which are the outgoing boundary components. So this field theory has a definite dimension, n, I guess you can see that, but it also has these background fields. So background fields are sections of a sheaf-like thing. They're local. They're defined on n-dimensional manifolds, and they transform, they pull back under um, local diffeomorphisms. And they include examples like metrics, connections, spin structures, so on. So they might be topological, they might be geometric, and have local information. The, um, yeah. Okay, so the codomain, meaning where the field theory takes its values, is some linear space, typically, in physics, certainly, like a category of topological vector spaces, and maps between them, nice maps between them. And so a field theory is a homomorphism, just as a group representation is. That is to say, it takes compositions to compositions and disjoint unions to tensor products. So I want to emphasize that this kind of axiom system, even though originally in the late 80s it wasn't really envisioned for honest quantum field theories that have local degrees of freedom, that actually it's more and more being thought of in that way. And uh, this recent preprint uh, not only talks about the axiom system, but proves a theorem um, in that context. Okay, well, a very important extension of that came shortly afterwards in the 90s where we don't just consider n minus one and n manifolds, but we consider um, all the way down to points. 
So as Constantine said, you can consider any range in between, and that's important. But here we're considering what you might call the fully local case. So in two dimensions, we would have two manifolds with corners. Those are the, at the top of the structure. And we could have one manifolds with boundaries and then points. But again, always embedded in a little bit of a two manifold. And there are a lot of open questions here. So what is the appropriate codomain? Where should this take values, particularly for physics? <coughs> I want to emphasize that this definition is flexible. It has lots of mutations. So even the two-tier one, we don't have to take complex vector spaces. We could take vector spaces over any field. We could take modules over ring. We could take derived versions of that, chain complexes, and many, many variations that have proved useful. Okay. The two pillars of quantum field theory physicists always talk about are locality and unitarity. These axioms encode locality in a very strong form, but we could ask, what about unitarity? And if you think about representation theory, particularly of, say, non-compact, semi-simple Lie groups like SL2R, not every representation is unitary. And similarly, the quantum field theories, say, topologically twisted supersymmetric theories, those too are not unitary. So unitarity is not something you want to encode, but you certainly want to know about unitarizability and what the unitary structure is. Okay, as Constantine emphasized, we need to understand what this extended field theory is for general quantum field theories. Um, I want to say that even though this arose, thinking about locality in the early uh, 1990s, it um, encodes defects. And that's part of extended uh, field theory, which was explained by Kapustin, the relationship. So again, the cobordism hypothesis is a very powerful tool in topological field theory. And one goal of the collaboration is to apply all of these powerful tools to problems in physics. Okay, so I should be mindful of the time. Uh, so how do we measure whether these axiom systems are on target? How do we know if they're on target? And I wanna say that in mathematics, they've had an impact in several different areas. And I won't go through in detail, but um, they've appeared, they've appeared meaning not only that some result in the field theory has been useful, not as much, but that the structure has been recognized there. And as I said, when you, you know you have a good definition or a good axiom system, when you start to see that structure in places that it didn't come from. The concept of a group came from Gauss's study of binary quadratic forms, maybe Galois, but of course a group comes in many, many forms, unexpected. And here we're seeing in mathematics this kind of axiom system, the structure of a field theory coming in different places. Well, in physics, as Nati said, this hasn't had the impact that the agreement between uh, you know, perturbative quantum field theory and, and the experiments have had. But nonetheless, I think there have been places where these um, these axioms have had some impact. For example, recently they've had some impact in um, condensed matter physics, again a place where they didn't originate in terms of classifying invertible phases. It gave a uniform formula and techniques for computing that matched what were very different ideas and very different tools that were being used by uh, condensed matter physicists. So, but there are many other um, kinds of places and in particular, these ideas are used to study symmetry and to study anomalies in quantum field theory. And that's very much, again, something as part of this collaboration. So again, there are many open problems. Um, one could ask to develop the relationship between this kind of Heisenberg and Schrodinger points of view. Some of that is being done certainly already. I think the most important is to develop analytic aspects of, uh, of these axiom systems. There is a notion of a renormalization group flow, for example, and to understand when a theory is gapped, how you might extract a long distance uh, topological theory, and so on. Again, trying to understand what extended theory means in the context of a quantum field theory that's not scale invariant. And, um, and how do you relate this to the kinds of things that Nati talked about? It seems like a very different world in a way from that, 
But again, I want to emphasize that complete ordered field seems a different world from how we think of the real numbers and use them and how people before that definition really thought about the real numbers and used them. And then quantum gravity. What is quantum gravity? Could we find such an axiom system there? So returning to the question, what is quantum field theory? Well, we don't know. But from this point of view that I presented about conceptualizing the structure, trying to axiomatize some of its basic properties, these different axiom systems are the best that we know, I think. And um, these newer geometric axioms have led to a lot of understanding, I think, as I said, in topological aspects, algebraic aspects, and so on. But as Nadi emphasized, that's a very small part of quantum field theory. And a major challenge is to integrate that with the analytic aspects, some of which are captured by the previous generation of axiom systems in flat Minkowski spacetime, although those axiom systems, again, don't cover all um, quantum field theories by any stretch. Well, can we make examples of these axiom systems? Again, there are many topological and uh, so on examples, conformal examples. And those can be used, as Constantine indicated, as parts of studying a quantum field theory that's not scale invariant, where that other quantum field theory sits on the boundary, and you can use the tools in the bulk to investigate a piece of the theory. But we'd like to understand more. So this collaboration centers on symmetry, and that's a very fertile ground and a great arena to explore these more general, very long-term questions. All right, so that's what I have to say. And at this point, it's open for discussion. People in this room, people in Edinburgh, and people on Zoom, if someone wants to make a comment or question. So please, you're encouraged to do so. Yeah. You'll have to speak very loud. If you want to ask what is x, we can also ask what is not x. So are there some properties we can definitely say not including the quantum field theory framework? <laughs> so the question is, if we can say what x is, we should also be able to say what not x is. Um, Nati, do you want to comment on that? So the question is, what is not a quantum field theory? Go beyond quantum field theory. So I'll give two answers. None of them is satisfactory since, since you asked me. One is the Clinton question. Maybe we should first clarify what is is. Or in, I would say that I would really use the standard framework. We'll know it when we see it. At the moment, I don't know what is and what is not. So, so these two answers are not useful, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know that I can top that particularly. <laughs> I mean, I can say that, again, it's coming up in unexpected places, say in mathematics. You might not have thought that the uh, geometric language program before this influence had something to do with quantum field theory, and there are lots of other examples. So I'm not sure that we want to take the posture of saying it's not going to be like this. But the way I interpreted the question is not, I, I'm sure that quantum field theory, with some definition, it has a lot of applications. Some of them are unexpected. It's like a mathematical framework, which has many, it appears in many places. And history is full of examples of the same mathematical structure appearing in different places. You mentioned group theory as an example, but there are also many others. Calculus appeared in many places and so forth. The way I interpret the question is, what is not quantum field theory? And that is, I think, more challenging because how far should we in enlarge the boundary of what we call quantum field theory? For example, do we include the little string theory within quantum field theory? What about the examples with fractals? So I, my, I ended with these things that are, I called it a glimpse of going beyond, but I was careful to say beyond the standard framework of quantum field theory. So if there could very well be some subset, which is what we normally call quantum field theory, and there would be another set, 
which is larger, which includes more things that do not include gravity, but satisfy standard quantum mechanics and so forth. I think it will be very interesting to explore it further. One thing I would like to say from experience is that all these examples that are not standard quantum field theory, whether we call it quantum field theory or not, all of them were discovered by accident. Nobody was setting out to a, a task. Let's try and find an example which is outside the standard framework. That's not how they were discovered. People tried to find examples within the framework and they realized that the examples that we're studying are not part of the standard framework. My take on that is that if we found three classes by accident, for all we know, there are billions of other such examples that can also be discovered. And it's not clear whether they will come and for where, so I do not have more to add to that. Yeah, I think the same could be said in mathematics, that as I said, the Satya Siegel axiom can be summarized by saying you have a symmetric monoidal functor or homomorphism from boardism, something geometric, to something linear like vector spaces. But you could replace that boardism by, say, a category of graphs or perhaps, you know, CW, more general topological spaces. You can replace the codomain not by complex vector spaces, but as I said, other kinds of uh, objects. And then those are being discovered and tried to use, trying to use them in very different um, kinds of contexts. So for example, I mentioned on one of the slides what are called finite homotopy uh, topological field theories. Those were actually introduced, uh, right, 1990 or 1991 by Frank Quinn, who was studying what's called the Andrews Curtis conjecture in topology and tried to apply it there. So again, there are unexpected places where you might find the structure or mathematical mutations of it as a tool, and you want to still call those field theories. Well, it fits that basic structure, but what the boundary of that is, I don't know that you want to circumscribe at this point. Uh, are, there, are there some in, no, okay, Alexi, go ahead. Yes. Uh, what are the most important uh, aspects of uh, field theory? Let me name two aspects of conventional field theories, and uh, maybe you have so something else in mind. Uh, one aspect is uh, a continuum limit. We're, we're taking a continuum limit, say, uh, of a lattice theory. And uh, the other one is everything is defined in terms of uh, partition function, like uh, correlation functions are derivatives of uh, the partition function, and uh, one can define the partition function on closed manifolds and so on. So these are uh, two possibilities, but uh, there may be others. I have nothing useful to add. <laughs> uh, we have a question here. <coughs> Excuse me, we have a question here in Edinburgh, uh, Andre. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not really a question, rather a sort of sequence of thoughts. Um, so we have seen in um, Nathan's beautiful overview of different approaches. Um, that there are a number of approaches. There's, for example, the Lagrangian approach. Uh, there is the uh, axiomatic approach. We have the Hagkastler approach, the um, uh, Whiteman axioms. We have more recently uh, the um, factorization algebra approach by Kevin Costello and collaborators. Um, so I propose to not try to make them all equal to each other, but rather to draw some kind of Venn diagram where we, tr we put inside this Venn diagram various models that can be described, like s some quantum field theories can be described in more than one approaches. Some uh, quantum field theories maybe do not have a uh, Lagrangian formulation. And so they will, like uh, this Venn diagram is going to be a thing that where you see which of these ovals that one is going to be drawing is going to contain more examples of quantum field theories. And um, I mean, th I'm just proposing a sort of an, an approach to how to organize this question of what is quantum field theory. It's, it's a bit premature to offer one answer, but this is a way forward. 
So I'm visualizing. I want to say that it's straightforward. In fact, when I prepared my talk, I had a Venn diagram at some point with these examples, and I found that it, I, it was just too cluttered. So I decided to discard that slide. And for any one of, when I went through the various views, I tried to say which one is a subset of the others, but there's also a lot of overlap. And we know lots of examples which fit in various different examples. So let me just to show you that an example, consider the icing model. The icing model clearly exists in the lattice approach. In fact, this is where it started its life. It also exists in the Lagrangian approach. In fact, it exists in the Lagrangian approach in two different ways, either as a free massless fermion, when we, we can be formed with a mass term, or as a 5 fourth field theory, using the landau ginsburg description with 5 fourth theory. It also exists in the solvable field, because Onsager found, solved the model on the lattice, and then the continuum it also solved. So, the reason people so focus on the, and it also has categorical symmetries and ordinary symmetries and so on and so forth. So, the, and it's a rational conformal field theory. So it really fits in many different places. And this is one of the reasons it's so popular because it's an example in many cases. I can also give you examples of theories and I mentioned some of them in the talk that fit only one of these, but not others. For example, the two zero theory does not have a lattice, does not have a Lagrangian formulation and so forth, but there's no doubt that it exists. And there are many other examples that kind of in between, one thing is a subset of the others. I tried to put it on, on one slide and it simply became messy. I do not, I think that every practitioner in the field who comes from the more high energy point of view is fully familiar with this Venn diagram. So there's no point in elaborating, uh, on elaborating. What's really missing is to have just one thing that covers the whole thing instead of patches with transition functions and various sections that do not extend over the whole space. And excuse the analogy if it's not precise enough. Well, I, if you could make the effort that actually I know it's a messy Venn diagram, but I'd be quite curious to see it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to happen right now, but if you could share that, that <clears throat> if it's possible, that would be quite interesting. Well, I, I can go through my slides and tell you which one goes, which uh, one is embedded yeah. in which, but I think I tried to say that, but uh, I, I, the reason I tried to say that is that I had the Venn diagram in mind, which I discarded. <laughs> Maybe we should think of that as more of an open cover, but not canonical of the elephant and perhaps not even plainer. So I think there's a question in the chat, is that great? Uh, go ahead, Theo. I, yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah, I, was, I was thinking more about this uh, question of what is not a quantum field theory. So you know, how about the weather? <laughs> is the weather a quantum field theory? I mean, it's a field theory, right? You, can, you, have a, you have a temperature field, you have a velocity field. Is that a quantum field theory? I think I have a. I think you might say that probably it's not a quantum field theory because you can't make it quantum because you can't make it renormalizable. But nobody mentioned anything about renormalizability. Isn't it the classical field theory? Well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So, is that an example of something which is not a quantum field theory? Well, uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure it's obvious that it's classical. I mean, there are fluctuations, right? And this there's a framework to deal with the fact ah, Okay, so, so what about the weather? Well, <clears throat> and just along those lines, let me point out that in the axiom system I discussed, there's no uh, distinction in a way between classical and quantum. You could say that what's classical is an invertible field theory, but I'm not sure that matches completely the use of classical. Certainly classical field theories can be thought of as invertible field theories, but whether that's the way you want to axiomatize what it means to be classical or quantum, I'm not so sure. In any case, I think there's another question in the chat. Theo, go ahead. Uh, so Jin Cheng Gu from Zoom asks, in Nathan's talk, there were lots of perspectives. What does this collaboration focus on the most or a mixture? What does this, oh, which of those perspectives? Well, I think it'll focus on various of them. 
I think that'll come through in some of the talks we're going to hear, um, particularly from the physicists in the, in the next few days. But I think uh, you know, the kinds of field theories where we're trying to apply methods about symmetry, categorical symmetry, and so on, are studied by all those methods, by lattice methods, by perturbation theory, supersymmetric field theories, et cetera. So I think, I think a lot of those will enter into our collaborations work. Uh, go ahead, Clay. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask um, maybe more of a question for Dan. So uh, high energy physicists are very used to using functional integrals, even if as a cartoon way of organizing our thoughts about what a field theory is. And do you see in the kind of uh, cobordism hypothesis or axiomatic framework along those lines some role for something like a functional integral? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think if you <coughs> look at Graham Siegel's uh, paper on conformal field theory, he says quite explicitly that what he's doing is axiomatizing what a functional integral outputs. So I said that the domain Bordism category has these fields, which I called background fields, but I didn't put in what you would call fluctuating fields. So those have disappeared by the time we get to this definition. In other words, whatever functional integral might have been used to construct the theory, or it might have been constructed by one of the other methods that Nati talked about, um, that's not part of axiomatizing, in a sense, the answers to what the theory is, right? That's what I said an axiom system is supposed to do, is to try to capture the essence of what something is. So what is the role of the functional integral? It's absolutely in constructing examples. Now, there's all the analytic difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. There are all these nice, what you might call toy examples, except they occur as pieces of um, less toy examples, where that path integral is finite, where there's only a finite sum to be done, and then the analytic dis uh, difficulties disappear. But absolutely, those analytic aspects of the functional integral are very much what I would see being used to construct lots of examples. And I will say again that in uh, Kevin, in the Costello-Gwilliam approach, in all the people working there, they've used perturbation theory, and the perturbation theory that came, of course, from, from the physics to construct lots of examples and then prove interesting theorems and discover new things, Yangians and integrable systems on the one hand, maybe mirror symmetry and higher genus. Lo lots of concrete examples came out of that, which is uh, using the per perturbation theory part of the functional integral in that axiom system. If I may, I'd like to interject on Greg's question about the weather. <laughs> uh, parenthetically, that I worked as a weatherman for five years, so I think it makes me semi-qualified to address that. So first of all, it's clear that it is a classical field theory coupled to random sources. Okay, so all the fluctuations come from the random sources. The second point is that even as a classical field theory, before we quantize it, it might be incomplete. And in fact, this is a problem in mathematics because roughly speaking, the weather is not a Stokes equation. And whether Navier-Stokes equation can develop singularity, which will make it in, which will make it incomplete, is a known problem in mathematics. I'm not an expert in it, but I'm told that it has not yet been fully addressed. So even as a classical field theory, even if we turn off the random sources, it is still a, an open question of whether it exists. Then came the question of whether we can quantize it, and here I don't see why this is such an issue because there are many classical field theories that are not renormalizable. So the issue of lack of renormalizability, so for example, we can consider phi to the eighth field theory in four dimensions, it's not renormalizable. So it cannot be quantized. The modern view of this is that that does not mean that the quantum field theory does not exist. What it really means is that phi to the eighth in four dimensions is a good low energy field theory of another field theory with higher energies which completes it. In fact, even QED, which is a spectacular theory with the best agreement between theory and experiment in any theory, is really not UV complete as a quantum theory because of the Landau pole. So all in all, I view all of these as quantum field theories. They're either effective field theories that need completion at short distances or complete theories like N equals four super young meals, which presumably exists exactly. Okay, Nadi, thank you. That was, that, was, that was very clarifying. So, 
uh, is this another part of the elephant or is this an example of something that's not a quantum filter? I think it's in the sense that uh, you I guys mean, for me, it's, an, it's part of the elephant in the sense that, first of all, I think I gave credit to the, about the elephant, I think I gave credit to Ken Intrilligator. I'm not 100% sure, but the credit does go to Ken Intrilligator. I've heard him use this many times, including in my birthday. So thank you, Ken, about the elephant. For me, the weather is part of the elephant. It's a classical book theory. Even as a classical field theory, it might or might not be completely short distances. We don't know. And independent of that, it can be quantized. And if it's non-renormalizable, so be it. It just means that we have to add a UV completion to make it complete. All right. Well, if these New Jersey guys are through talking about the weather, we have time for one more question. <laughs> Any more comments? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so th this follows on actually to Navi's answer. I mean, wh one of the things that I don't really hear mentioned is this idea that, you know, degree, the, the effective degrees of freedom that you're analyzing get reduced from the microscopic ones, whether these be lattice or continuum. And I think Greg said this for a second, there, you know, nowhere was the renormalization group mentioned in all of this and this seems very counter to most people's intuition on what you know quantum field theory is the wilsonian picture and i just well throwing that out there is something to comment on i mean because oh, what sorry one more thing in the topological approach of course you've reduced the the system to almost no degrees of freedom and um and and i, I it seems to me a little bit simple to expect that that kind of reductionist approach works for everything. So, you, well, throw that open for a comment. Well, just one comment. I'd like, I would like to say a few things about that. First of all, I tried to emphasize the renormalization group in the various views that I presented. So that's one thing. Maybe I, I also emphasize that the renormalization group is not going to work in this case in a simple way these examples of uh, mixing between UV and IR. So I think the normalization group is essential in, in the first part of my talk when I talked about the different views. And it's being challenged in these examples that go outside the standard framework. And I, basically that it's being challenged because the, the renormalization group uh, does not fit very well. As part of another comment you made, I'd like to uh, to say something. You use the phrase degrees of freedom. The modern view of quantum field theory is that the notion of degrees of freedom is not good. Not good, not in the sense that it's bad, but sometimes there are good degrees of freedom and sometimes they are not. The modern way of saying it is that if there is a Lagrangian description, then the fields of the Lagrangian can be thought of as the degrees of freedom. But sometimes, there is no Lagrangian description, and then we have no set of degrees of freedom. Conversely, sometimes we have duality, and we have two different, and we have two different sets of Lagrangians, and therefore we have two different sets of degrees of freedom to describe the same physics. So the notion of degrees of freedom is a not unique, and sometimes it doesn't even exist in a standard way. So let me just shed more light on it. If you try to count the number of degrees of freedom in quantum field theory, there are various measures of it. So, for example, in n equals four super young mills, the number of degrees of freedom grows like n squared. This is roughly the number of gluons. If, when we go to the higher dimensional theories, like the two zero theory, Greg is more of an expert on that than I am. I think it grows to a higher, larger power than n. Perhaps it's n cubed. Not sure about the exponent. N cubed tells us that it cannot possibly be any standard uh, number of degrees of freedom the, the way we usually think about it. So the upshot of all that is that the use of degrees of freedom has been very powerful, it's very useful, but it might send us in the wrong direction. So let me just say two quick things, Paul. Um, one is, I, I did allude to anyway, that uh, the renormalization group flow is 
in a sense, part of those Atiyah Siegel axioms. If you have a metric as one of your background fields, then the Bordism category has one parameter group, which just uniformly expands the metrics. And that, if you compose that with a given theory, that is the renormalization group flow. So you would want to control that in both extremes, UV and IR. The second comment, just to echo what Nati said, is that the degrees of freedom don't show up in those axiom systems. As I said to Clay, everything's been integrated out before we write the axiom systems, which are axiomatizing the answers. And so degrees of freedom in that sense didn't enter there. Well, I think, sorry for those who still had comments, but we'll all be around and hope that the discussion continues. So thanks, Nati, and um, we'll have a break until 11 this time. Thank you.